Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Trek Cannon. So today I'm going to be doing a series review of Star Trek Discovery Season 5, the final season. First, let me begin by saying that it's always a heartbreak to me uh, when people lose their employment, especially when it's a steady stream of employment. And uh, it's always sorry to see that happen with a group of talented production individuals like was on Discovery. Uh, if it's one thing that I can say that was consistent throughout all of the seasons of Star Trek Discovery, it was the production team. It was the people who did the, um, the, the graphics, the special effects, the set designs, the costumes. Those people were top notch. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't have the writers to back them up, the showrunners and storytellers to back them up. But as far as the production team, bravo, people, bravo. I will have to say that Star Trek Discovery was one of the best-looking Star Trek series to date. Now, that being said, I want to congratulate everybody who is the actors and actresses that contributed to the show. I know that they did their best with what they were given, and I know we had some talented individuals that were there, but unfortunately, they wasn't able to shine based on, like, again, the material. Now, the material wasn't woke. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't all of this crazy, uh, D, none of that. Anybody who knows my videos know that I will not describe anything, uh, uh as inaccurate, uh, as a show with that particular phrase. What I will say is, uh, the negatives. What brought the show down for me? What brought the show down for me over all of the seasons was a few things. And let's get into them. The first thing, the writing. Okay, now going back to the first season of Discovery, it was already going to be a hard sell trying to get us uh, endeared to a protagonist that uh, in the first episode, got their captain uh, murdered and got uh, and got the Federation into a war with the Klingons, and through all of that, uh, because of a mutiny, all right, a failed mutiny. Now, having us introduced to that character as being a protagonist already was going to be a hard sell. Now, it's not like that we haven't had characters like this throughout Star Trek canon that has grown on us. Think about people like uh, that uh, that uh, psycho dude from Voyager, you know him, the one who had that outstanding story arc. Uh, think about uh, people like, um, think about people like Ensign Ro Laren, you know, these people were people who wasn't the best Starfleet officers, not nearly the best Starfleet officers, but because of how they characters were written. They turned out to be some of the more interesting and thought-provoking and multi-dimensional characters of the, of the show. You know, um, people like Garrick, you know. So when, you know, so they did a very big disservice to the writing of the, of our, you know, protagonists. Another thing is prequels, okay? Especially when it comes to a series like Star Trek, all right? Prequels aren't really good because, Star Trek is a is a show that envisions the future, always continuing towards the future. OK, boldly going where no person has gone before. Um, you know, that 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 whole idiom is counterproductive to a prequel going back in time, going to where we previously were. You know, um, shows like Enterprise did a pretty good job of explaining things like that. But. As far as having another show set in that time frame, n n no. It seems like even Strange New Worlds, as good as it is, you know, um, we already know what's going to be the outcome of people like Captain Pike, people like uh, Una, well, <laughs> at least in real life, uh, you know, uh, stuff like that. So what Trekkies want to see is things that happen as a result of the canon that we have already experienced. How does uh, how does um, paradise continue to grow? Now, here's the thing about Discovery. Another one of his things, all right? One of the things that Gene Roddenberry was always against was interpersonal or uh, um, crew drama, all right? Deep Space Nine show that, one, if done correctly... Uh, that type of infused, that type of drama infused into interactions between the crew members uh, and, you know, Starfleet personnel, you know, all that kind of stuff, if done well, can be some of the most thought-provoking 
you know, well written uh, uh, writing ever. OK, but when you try to say, OK, one, I didn't know anybody on the bridge. I knew Saru. I knew Captain George Joe. You know, I know Captain Lorca. Right. Um, I knew, uh, you know, Burnham. OK, I know Tilly. But as far as anybody else, you know, uh, the other seven members of the bridge, you know what I mean? Uh, ops, cons, security, you know, science officers, stuff like this. You know, uh, these roles were very ambiguous starting off. You know, another thing about Discovery is Spore Drive. Now, I understand that there are all different types of faster than light travel uh, mechanisms in Star Trek. Okay, you got solid time waves, you got warp drives, you got transwarp conjuries, you got wormholes, you got folding space. You have all types, whatever Q does, you have all types of propulsion in Star Trek. But a spore drive, I, you know, even though the concept was pretty interesting, I don't think it fit into the uh, canon of Star Trek. That whole little, um, you know, tardigrade system and network and all that mycelial network, all of that was pretty. Uh, fantastical, you know, when it, on, on, on a fantastical side of science fiction, as opposed to the realistic side or theoretical side of science fiction that Star Trek has always tried to, you know, keep going and try to touch on. Um, another thing about Discovery was uh, each, each one of his seasons was always a story that was, okay, we got eight episodes or nine, you know, 13 episodes that deal with, okay, this is going to be this world galaxy ending event. And each one of the events was something that was first season with the AI from section 31, never something that they covered in canon. All right. So that was weird. You know, uh, the second one with the uh, anomaly that was running around destroying everything, you know, uh, the burn, you know, all these types of things you like, you know, like, you know, what is this purpose now? Uh, speaking of the burn, having Lazarus be the reason for the burn would have made so much more sense than the than what they had. And please understand, spoilers, you know, continue on. But um, to have Lazarus from the original series be the reason for the burn, you know, the problem with the lithium, that would have been so much more feasible in canon as opposed to, you know, what they had. The Red Angel, you know, all of these things were built up to be ooh and you know but I wouldn't even say that because you couldn't get really get excited because of the writing of each episode the things that they talked about the things they chose to focus on even the techno babble anybody familiar with Star Trek understands certain levels of techno babble there are certain things that Star Trek um that we are as Trekkies are accustomed to having explained um based on the situation that's going you know what I mean? Like, we know how shield frequencies and shields work. We know how inertial adaptants and warp drive and all of these things work. You know what I mean? Based on the theory in canon. You know, so when you start trying to throw techno babble in there that that doesn't fit that bar, it is easily recognized and it throws people off. You know, Discovery is really good with that. Now, here's the thing. When we get to season five, which is the final season of uh, Star Trek Discovery, man, you know, my my stepchild, when we get to the final season, um, here's the thing, trying to find a progenitor's tech, an extension, an a 8 to 13 episode extension of the hunt from the original, from uh, the next generation. Now, with the progenitor tech, being able to create life and manipulate life and all that stuff, like I've said in uh, my reviews before, these are all things that Star Trek, Starfleet itself is able to do. Right off the top of my head, the Genesis device, the Genesis technology is able to do these things. You know what I mean? So I was really interested in why they had decided to look for the progenitor technology, um, that they were looking for the progenitor technology. And here's the thing. If they were looking for the progenitor technology for some reason that you could understand, like, oh, OK, I want to unlock the messages of how each one of us are um, are linked you know there's always been questions about hey how's a Vulcan and a human able to have babies or how's a you know a Romulan I mean how's a uh, Cardassian and a Bajoran able to have kids when they are different species that's not usually something that you know usually only things from the same species can procreate you know so when they threw in the episode the hunt 
you know, it was really cool to know that, all right, these beings, these humanoid be beings seeded the galaxy. These humanoid, hu these humanoid beings were far superior than, say, um, even the most ancient of the species, you know? Think about races like the Iconians or something like that. But the way that they executed it, we're going around looking for these clues. Um, we got to uh, go against Maul and Locke, um, who, you know, like, what was the point of building up their relationship and their link to each other as if it was going to do, if it was going to affect the story in any way? The relationship between Book and um, uh, Locke, how did, uh, how did that, how did these things contribute to anything? Because I really... There wasn't too much character examination in it. it everything was so one-dimensional. Even uh, with the even with the doctor having the remnants of being uh, um, a host, you know, which is totally in canon. We already know this in canon. Think of when uh, Jadzia uh, went through that ceremony where she gave uh, you know people like Odo and all that stuff, and well, Odo became Curzon and everything like that. So people still have these memories. Of when they were joined, you know, think of uh, people like uh, <laughs> Commander Riker. He still knows some things about Trail. But anyway, um, just the climax of all of these stories, uh, it, I didn't think it really went anywhere. And then at the end, when, okay, so the progenitor technology speaks English. Okay, well, we got universal translators. Okay, so the progenitor technology is going to recognize you because you, okay, so when Maul did the symbol that was wrong, why didn't that kill her? What was going on with, like, uh, explain the device that this, that, that she said this whole world, this whole existence thing that they was on was uh, the technology. What was the thing with the rooms and everything? Like, okay, they see that they had some kind of Iconian technology or the Iconians had technology from them. You know, like, they didn't explain any of this. You know what I mean? And... You know, like having Saru come in and this whole faction of the uh, brain and just the way that they did the brain. It was just a weird, it was a weird season to me. You know, it was just really weird. So when I think about, and then when you get to the end, when you finally have got together all of the pieces, you got the puzzle straight. You went through all the trials and tribulations, um, tribulations, um, and the thing is saying, hey, uh, we want you to learn. We want you to um, be the keeper of this place. Instead of you being like, oh, okay, I think that um, this technology would benefit the Federation and Starfleet uh, because we have evolved to the point out of all these, th you know, thousands of years, the thousands of years and everything, we've evolved to the point where as humans, we could take on this responsibility. That should have been the point of start of of that. You know what I mean? But no. Okay. Well, we ain't ready yet. Uh, nobody's ready yet. Uh, uh, throw it inside a black hole, and somebody might get it later. What then? What was the point? What was all the point? You know, what was the what has the uh, what has Star Trek's exploration of the human condition in Discovery? How did how did it lead up to this that we still wasn't ready for? It? You know, out of all of the problems that Discovery's been through, you would think that the ending would be some kind of payoff, not something that's oh, okay. Well, you know, now we get into the last thirty minutes of the show after everything, and now down we fast forward about thirty-five years into the future. Okay. And uh, Burnham's an admiral. Um, you know, she's married to Book. You know, come to find out they have a son that's a captain. And uh, <laughs> I like their little swag and everything like that. But it's interesting using the words that they was using because it's thousand and some centuries, like 1,500 years old, you know, of, of verbiage. You know, see nobody walking around in this damn period talking about some, uh, you know, old English words. That's, that'd be weird, right? But... The thing is, is that I think they did Discovery, Zora, really bogus. I think they did her really bogus. So you could take Moriarty, Moriarty a thousand years ago and put him in a, and put him in a system where he believes that um, 
he has a whole galaxy at his whim. But you're going to take Zora and make a wait out there in the middle of nowhere as time passes by until just the end of time and somebody come out there and get her. Y'all think y'all thought that was cool to do with a family a family member, a sentient member of the crew. Zora, right. That, right, right. That's what we're going to do. Now, I do like the send off. Um, I do. I, I did love how when Burnham got on the bridge of Discovery and it flashed back to everybody being on the bridge and saying their goodbyes. That was a touching moment. You know, I love uh, moments like that because in actuality, whenever anything comes to an end and, you know, you move out of an apartment, move out of a house and, you know, you are in it at one last time before you close the door, lock it and turn in the key, you know, for a moment, you know, you remember, you see these things, all of the memories that you had of this place, all of the people that you encountered, all the friends, family and loved ones that occupied this place of love. You know what I mean? So that was a totally beautiful uh, moment. It would have just been better if we had had personal relationships with most of the people that they show in that. But as far as the send off, man, that was a beautiful send off. But anyway, as far as overall, man, Star Trek Discovery, um, all five seasons, uh, it has been problematic. It has been my problem, stepchild. Um, none of the seasons to me were stand outish. I don't remember any episodes that would last the test of time. Things like, um, you know, City on the Edge of Forever, you know, the Inner Light, uh, you know, uh, Visitors, CJAR558, you know, Timeless, you know, uh, Scorpion 1 and 2. You know, these, you know, they don't have any episodes that I think will stand the test of time, you know, but what did you guys think of Discovery overall, you know, from beginning to end or of the fifth season? What did you guys think of the characters and the character development? Um, what did you guys think of the technology and use of the technology in Star Trek? Um, yeah, let me know in the comments. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And as always, peace, recycle, and say the whales. And... Uh, Discovery, you be cool.